Welcome to a special episode of the Walter Bosley channel here at YouTube. And I have been wanting to bring guests on for a while now. And I'm, I'm finally doing that. And we're going to start with uh, today's guest. Laura London is the creator and host of the podcast Speaking of Young, Interviews with Jungian Analysts created in 2015. Now, Laura and I have uh, known each other for a couple of years and have had incredible conversations and discussions about all sorts of uh, strange things. And today I wanted to bring her on because there are some topics and discussions in this field of our interest here at the channel and in the, the greater ufology, paranormal, and alternative research community, um, specifically uh, on the issue of synchronicity, which is a very popular topic these days. And of course, uh, people are always interested in the philosophical and uh, other interesting implications of the UFO phenomenon. And... Carl Jung not only provided us with the definition of synchronicity, uh, he also had some very interesting things to say about UFOs. So this is why I invited Laura here today to really clarify what Carl Jung actually did and didn't say about synchronicity in UFOs. And, and this is kind of a a general, um, let's consider this a general introduction to this discussion because, um, I, you know, this is such a big topic. These are such big topics uh, that I'm sure Laura and I will be back on to discuss further, you know, details on this. So let me start by uh, welcoming Laura. How are you, Laura? Hi, Walter. I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Um, I'm ready to uh, jump into this because these are such uh, interesting, you know, uh, topics to discuss uh, in general and specifically from the perspective of, you know, a Jungian scholar such as yourself. Um, now, my experience with UFOs, I've talked about quite a bit um, recently in, in the last couple of years, and most of the listeners here at the Walter Brasley channel uh, know, you know, the details of that. And I came away from that with um, a, a very, uh, again, that word philosophical, uh, but um, a different perspective than, you know, thinking that it was some type of encounter with ETs. I, I very distinctly yeah. Do not think that I. It it had very personal implications um, that reflected research activity I had done that very afternoon of the night I saw my UFO. So that you know that UFO experience w was profound for me, and it had elements that made it profoundly personal. Now on synchronicity, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share an example with you in the audience. And I figured, you know, you could tell me, is it synchronicity from the perspective of Carl Jung, um, or or is it not? Or, or you know, we can we can start with that example. And that was back in. It was, if I'm not mistaken, it was in sometime in the second half of 2008. This was after my father had passed away that summer, and. My dad had died at the age of 71. And so after he passed away, I had been, of course, dabbling in scientific remote viewing. And a friend of mine at the time, a buddy I knew from high school, we had reconnected and he's interested in this stuff. And when he wanted to um, you know, help me test the whole remote viewing experience. So what he did was he gave me a blind target and I remote viewed that it was a blind target of a place that he was going to drive us to. And um, so I re did my remote viewing the night before. And 
um, I came up with distinct shapes and the details like you do. And then he drove us to where we were going. Now, I didn't know where this place was. On the way there, as we got within just a few miles, I suddenly was hit with the only way to put it was like a, a wave of um, anxiety and nausea. And we, we had to stop and I had to catch my breath and get control of that. And then we continued on and where we ended up going was uh, Devil's Gate, uh, Devil's Gate Park next to JPL out here in Pasadena. Now, mm -hmm. Devil's Gate Dam is there. And this, this place has a history, of course, with Jack Parsons and, um, you know, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which he was a founder of. But also, it has a history with strange phenomena and, and, and you know, I, there's a missing child story connected with it and such. It's just a very interesting, weird place with a, a almost a cultic history to it. So we get there, we park, we get out, and we, we walk from the parking lot into the park to go look around. And almost immediately, we happen upon a concrete slab, okay? And this concrete slab was in the exact shape um, that I had remote viewed blindly the night before, the exact shape. And what was very interesting in addition was that this was a tee on a Frisbee golf course, if you've ever heard of Frisbee golf. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, with the balls and the clubs, it's you throw frisbees to where the, the pin is. And uh, it was it was an interesting um, tee pad because it was almost like a um, octagonal. I think it was um, the six sided. What is that? Hex shape or what? Anyway, yes. yeah, like that hexagonal. But here's the the part that for me made it synchronicity. Um, it's the first one, the, the first notable feature that I happen upon when we enter this park. And the number associated with it was 17. Now, 17 is a transposition of 71, right? Up until that time, um, I had been learning and uh, encountering transpositional numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me and the number 17 had popped up before in fact um it had popped up earlier that year um in another instance uh, before my dad had died and then here was the number 17 again and at that time um i had in my personal research as i said was was finding transpositional numbers popped up the transpositional number idea had already begun to factor um, heavily into an hypothesis that I have that has to do with something that happens after we die. Okay. So, so here was this transpositional number of my dad's age, the age he was when he died. And, you know, I, it, 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 when you add in all the factors that the reaction I had to the place right before we got there, the first note of the, the fact that I had remote viewed the, the actual shape of the pad, but the fact that that number, which I do indeed associate, you know, transpositionally with my dad's age, to me, that tied it all together. And in my mind, I, well, I have used the word synchronicity for that little episode that I just described. So, um, from your perspective and from Carl Jung's perspective, uh, am I right? Am I wrong? W where do people get it wrong? With okay, so, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, so this is a huge, huge and complicated subject, and it is uh, of particular interest a particular interest of mine and has been for quite some time. And it's one of the reasons why I started my podcast is because I thought that I would interview only Jungian analysts 
and we would get to the bottom. We would get that. That's how naive I was. We would get to the bottom of this subject. And Mm -hmm. it's been seven years now and there is no bottom, but I have gathered a lot of information and I'm happy to share all of that or whatever I can here with you today. But I would like to add something to what you were saying, because firstly, yes, to me, to me, that is asynchronicity. Mm -hmm. And while you were telling that story, I've not heard that particular story before. Pieces of it I had. Mm Mm-hmm. For instance, with the transpositional, uh, is that the word? Transpositional. I, word I'm I dyslexic, so I, I have trouble with sometimes with uh, words. Uh, n- numbers, you had mentioned that to me before. And while you were telling that story, I had my own synchronicity because as I mentioned to you before we started recording, I was going through my notes. I keep notes on every episode I do. I I interview these really well-educated, highly experienced clinicians and scholars and I, who've written books and I I keep lots of notes. Anyway, while I was going through my notes, looking for a particular uh, paragraph on synchronicity, I came across the, uh, the note that I had taken for an episode I did way back in 2015 with an analyst named Barbara Davies. And what I remember the most, it, I interviewed her in Zurich. Uh, she came to my hotel and it was just, it's one of the episodes I did that stands out the most, but, but because she mentioned the number 17 and mm-hmm. I didn't know that the number 17 was the number of completion and she was very mysterious about i wanted g- give me the source give me a reference you know i want to do some research on it i want to look it up and she never gave it to me except for uh one was it's here in the notes one kind of obscure reference to uh the feminine and fairy tales by marie louise von franz uh she said that um, there is where the number 17 was mentioned in the princess and the snake, but no, it goes deeper than that. It is an ancient Egyptian concept. And so you, in your story, you were talking about death Mm -hmm. and the number 17. And that was the, I'd like to hear more of the story because, you know, I'm a trained remote viewer. So I'm interested in, did you know where you were when you got there? Did you know the, the location? Not, I'm not outside of the remote viewing, but when you got there, did you, had you been there before or had you heard yeah. of that place? Yeah, yeah. I had been there probably uh, a year or so before uh, with a group of um, uh, other folks, many of whom my audience are familiar with. I, I went there with um, uh, Greg Bishop, Adam Go Rightly, and, you know, s- some other folks. And so th- you saw that number 17 where? I saw the number 17 specifically uh, embossed in the, I I believe it's embossed or painted on the concrete slab, which is the T, but I had not seen that particular um, hexagonal uh, slab of concrete. Right, right. Okay, and you associated it with your father who died at the age of 71, and it was the transposed number, and so... Yeah. To me, that's, it, I mean, it has meaning. So one of the criteria for synchronicity is mm-hmm. meaning mm-hmm. and that it's a causal. One does not cause the other. So, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get into that and I'll explain more about that. But I'm so interested in this because I had just come across the notes on Barbara Davies and mm-hmm. the the biggest takeaway from that episode is what she said about the number 17. And then I have something to say later about numbers being associated with synchronicity and Wolfgang Pauli and Marie Louise von Franz. And here the reference to the number 17 is in a book by von Franz. But uh, so where were we going with all of that? So that to me was my synchronicity because I had just seen that. Now, let's start splitting hairs here. Mm -hmm. 
about your question to me was, where do people get it wrong? Now, there would be some debate as to whether or not my experience was a synchronicity. Yours, I would say definitely was, and here's why, okay. A synchronicity is a causal, meaning there's no causality. One event did not cause the other. So there's no cause, okay? And it's between a mental state and a physical object. So a mental state, an internal state, a dream, a thought, a fantasy, something going on in the inner world and something going on in the outer world. It could be an event, a physical object. So it's something, it's a connection between those two different realms. And synchronicity is a mirroring. So it's a mirroring of that internal state or that internal event with the outside world. So there's a correlation between what's happening internally and externally. And that is my pet peeve. That is where uh, I'm, and, and that's important. It's not just a technicality that you can gloss over. And I, I hope we get into that with Jung's relationship with the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, because that is who helped Jung develop his idea of synchronicity, which happened over many decades. And <laughs> right, so that is important because this is about reality, maybe not being what we think it is. And right, right so that they're the, the inner world and the outside world are actually two aspects of one thing mm -hmm. that psyche and matter are not separate that they are two aspects of one thing and that is what i think people are completely missing i'm speaking in general terms completely missing with synchronicity because if you just say well you know how it was popular to say well i don't believe in coincidences right. okay well wh what does that mean what is a coincidence so a coincidence could could just be two things occurring simultaneously, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not a synchronicity. So what makes something a synchronicity, and we can go to Jung here, mm -hmm. his words. Uh, so if anyone would like to read the the essay, the essay that Jung wrote titled On Synchronicity, an A-Causal Connecting Principle. It's in volume eight of his collected works, which is titled The Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche. That's volume eight. There are 20 volumes of his collected works. They are all av available individually or as a set. I have the set because it was much more economical to purchase them as a set. Mm -hmm. You can buy them um, hardcover, paperback, or Kindle or ebook, iBooks has them as well. So anyway, volume eight, The Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche contains his essay on synchronicity, but now it was also published as a little book. So you can just buy that essay as a book titled Synchronicity. So he says, and, and he defines it over and over really uh, in this essay, but he says that it consists of two factors. A, an unconscious image comes into consciousness either directly, literally, or indirectly, symbolized or suggested, in the form of a dream, an idea, or a premonition. So that's one factor. An unconscious image comes into consciousness. And then B, an objective situation coincides with that content. So something in the inner world and something in the outer world, coinciding and having meaning. So if there's no meaning, there, there's no synchronicity. Uh, Beverly Zabriskie said, it's just a coincidence if it doesn't have meaning. Right. So the events, the inner event and the outer event are connected through their meaning. So when you saw that slab, 
mm-hmm. and you saw that number, that number had meaning to you. Yes. So, so, mm-hmm. so did, was there that that was where did you go from there? We went deeper into the park. I mean, I noted it and I was, you know, I told my friend immediately like, oh my gosh, um, you know, take, oh, well, I brought with me the, the viewing. So I had the sketch with me and I mm-hmm. said, take a look at this. And um, it was startling. But that wasn't the only image that I had drawn, uh, lest anyone think that I was pulling the wool over anybody's eyes because, yes, I had been to the park before. But um, as we went deeper into the park looking around, there were these random uh, uh, large blocks of granite or stone or whatever they were, Mm -hmm. um, uh, rectangular. And it it looks like that they had been part of some structure and they were off to the side on this one pathway and the shape of one and, and its position on the ground, I had viewed that. Mm-hmm. as well in the remote viewing. So, um, you know, there were multiple, we were walking around the park and there were m- multiple little things that I had, that I had remote viewed. Now, remember when I did the viewing the night before, I had no idea of the location I was right. viewing. So even though, I mean, it, it's, even though I've been to Disneyland, you know, 50 times in my lifetime, if you gave me a blind target to remote view now and it was Disneyland and I'm not aware that it's Disneyland, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter that I've been to Disneyland before, right? Right. right. It, it, what, what matters is, is that through a blind target number, I'm picking up, you know, things at Disneyland. Yeah. And okay, technically, so, right, for, for mm-hmm. as a remote viewer, uh, during the actual viewing session, <clears throat> we wouldn't say, oh, this is Disneyland. We would describe right. the location. We wouldn't right. give it right. We wouldn't give it a title. You just describe what you're seeing. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. he he had told me my my buddy had told me that um, what he would do was that he had considered you know three or four different places and um, you know so he had picked the place and and it's and we had not discussed. Uh, that park before mm-hmm. um, it, it's a popular site that, that shows up in books about weird things you know and I think he had a copy of weird California and it's in there so he had picked it randomly independent of any conversation mm-hmm. he had so so I just I don't want to forget to mention this because you also <laughs> brought up another uh, important part of synchronicity and this is not talked about much, but I did an episode with Beverly Zabriskie, who is a Jungian analyst, and she wrote the introduction, the preface, the foreword, I never know what the difference is between those things, to a book titled Adam, A-T-O-M, and Archetype. It's the letters of C.G. Jung and Wolfgang Pauli, which they were finally published. And she said she spent two years on that introduction. Wow. So she says that another um, another aspect of synchronicity that is important is the element of surprise. Mm-hmm. That it is always a surprise. And she mm-hmm. said, unless there's an element of surprise, nothing new is entering in. Mm-hmm. So, and this is kind of a, a more of an obscure concept um, among Jungians, but it it's about emergence. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of what, one of the things that differentiates Jung from Freud. Um, So Jung was about what is emerging uh, and about moving forward. So that was another thing that I realized when you were telling the story that did make this a synchronicity because you were surprised. There was that element of surprise um, and, and emergence. So, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, I thought mm-hmm. that this is, this is another amazing element of it. I forgot to mention earlier, because mm-hmm. describing this to you, I was so focused on the number, right? And the fact that I had remote viewed the things. Um, I need to add, um, this, when I got to the park, this number and the shape that I'd remote viewed Um, was directly related to the Frisbee golf course that's in the park, right? 
Okay, I forgot to add. My dad was the best natural athlete I ever knew personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all my life, he was an amazing golfer. I mean, Mm -hmm. I still have... uh, he, He has two or three... Uh, hole-in-one trophies th- th- that he won during tournaments, holes-in-one that he got during tournaments. I've, I've watched him do it several times, you know, playing a casual round. But there's further meaning in, you know, of all the things, what I remote viewed had to do with the Frisbee golf course. And with you know, so you had the number 17, which is transpositional to the age my dad was when he died, but also the fact that it's connected to the game of golf. In the park, it's frisbee golf. My dad played real golf, but still, you know, there's that. Yeah, that and, and I didn't know we were going to talk about numbers today, but I oh. added a section to my notes about numbers uh, mm-hmm. just before we started, and I'd like to go over that um, because I think it's relevant. Um, and there was something else I was going to say. Anyway, we'll start there. So there. Oh, the whole thing about numbers. Okay, where do we go? So Jung had a couple of heart attacks, actually. I, I think a lot of people that don't, don't know that. Uh, and also he wrote about the out-of-body experience he had when he was in the hospital after one of his heart attacks. And you can read about that in his autobiography. It's titled Memories, Dreams, Reflections. But during an illness in his 60s, and he lived into his 80s, mm-hmm. During this illness, um, he had a dream that he was in a valley of diamonds and he could fill his pockets with the diamonds. And he came to understand that those diamonds referred to everything that he hadn't said yet about the human psyche because he lived for another 20 years after that. And I think that his best writings were done in his later years. So he realized that he can only show a fraction of the diamonds that he had in his pockets. And he, you know, as I said, he lived for another 20 years or so. And that's when he wrote his major works. But one diamond, if you will, left untouched by him was the relationship between the inner and the outer, that that interface between mind and matter. And he believed that the key to that to that to that relationship between the inner world and the outer world mm-hmm. lay in the investigation of the concept of numbers as archetypes of the unconscious. But in later life, he wasn't in the best of health and um, his wife had passed away and he just, he didn't have a lot of energy to, to, to do everything he wanted to do. So he left that work to his colleague, Marie Louise von Franz, who I had mentioned earlier around the number 17. Uh, and which I had never made that connection before until now. So she, she took it on and she took on that task that he kind of bequeathed her. He, he, he left to her. So she wrote and published a book in the seventies titled number and time. And it explores this space time continuum and the significance, the psychological significance uh, of numbers, but she only covers the first four integers, one through four. And it's a very difficult book to read. Uh, I gave up, uh, I did an episode about it. The analyst that I interviewed, actually uh, Von Franz was one of his training analysts. So he actually knew her and she was Jung's uh, closest colleague and and a pupil for decades and um, the the probably best interpreter of Jung's work. So he he studied with her, um, but he wrote a book titled Valley of Diamonds, and we did an episode about it. And um, it's he also wrote a book about synchronicity, and it was one of the reasons why I started the podcast. So anyway, um, mm-hmm. what am I trying to say here that that this worldview based on numbers and 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 numbers manifesting in dreams 
and in you know everyday life and in science and in synchronicity um so it's it's a thing as we say it's a thing uh numbers and um as far as getting to the bottom of this no one's gotten to the bottom of it but there is a connection and this this uh, analyst that I interviewed that I'm talking about who wrote Valley of Diamonds, his name is J. Gary Sparks. He lives in Indianapolis and um, I interviewed him in the second uh, episode of my podcast. I actually went to Indianapolis and spent the day with him uh, and we did that episode about synchronicity and that book that he wrote about it is titled At the Heart of Matter and it's about the connection between Jung's Jung's branch of psychology is is technically called analytical psychology. And he, Gary Sparks, saw all these similarities between quantum physics and analytical psychology. And the relationship between Jung and Wolfgang Pauli was very deep and very long. Uh, Pauli was 25 years younger than Jung and he actually died first. So there was so much work left for those two to do together that they didn't do, but Pauli is who helped Jung develop his concept of synchronicity. So Jung did coin that term. That is Jung's term. Whenever mm -hmm. anybody says synchronicity, that came from Jung, his work with Wolfgang Pauli, and they were working on the mind matter connection. You know, the, the, the Jungians call it the mind body problem. I don't know why they call it problem. Um, but that connection between mind and body or matter, the, the body is matter. Mm -hmm. So they were working on that and, uh, and you know, until they just kind of ran out of time, but, uh, Another thing that I want to mention, because your original question was, what do people get wrong about synchronicity? You know, what is it and what isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, there's another analyst. I haven't interviewed him, but he's he's done a lot of shows and he's on YouTube. His name is Joseph Cambray. And he was, I think he was an astrophysicist, if I'm not mistaken. And then he went on to become a Jungian analyst, but he said, and this is another one of my pet peeves, is that I've heard so many people when they have a synchronicity think that it's this great thing or it's this positive, wonderful thing or that right. they're lucky or they're special. And mm -hmm. I laugh because from my experience, and I don't talk about this a lot because it sounds pretentious, I experience synchronicity every day. I mean, look at the beginning of the, when we started recording, that was a synchronicity that yeah. I had come across those notes from, I think it was like episode uh, 10, mm -hmm. 11, 12, somewhere in there with Barbara Davies from November of 2015. And I hadn't seen those notes in years. And it was about the number 17. You can go back and listen to that episode. A shameless plug here. All of the episodes of Speaking of Jung are available for free at speakingofjung.com. So you can listen to that episode and she talks about the number 17. And then here, again, I hadn't heard you tell this story before and it was about the number 17. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my pet peeve and Joseph Cambray, he said don't see synchronicities as positive just because they have a wow factor right okay? they it might not be a positive thing it is a thing it is how it is the nature i believe it is the nature of reality this synchronicity isn't some special thing that happens to special people or or when you know you 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 have a synchronicity and that means that you know you should buy that thing or marry that person no it's just showing you that the inner world and the outer world are connected they aren't separate and we're just noticing it right that's right. the way i see it we're just noticing it and 
So. Well, I, I you know, I want to to further emphasize that or to add to that, my first noticeable for me, noticeable to me, my first serious experiences with synchronicity came when, um, uh, of course, it was after I started remote viewing. There's that there's that remote viewing thing and what it exposes us to popping into this again. But it, it was mostly it has been mostly um, in, incredibly mostly uh, during the, the, those seven years that I was uh, very uh, deeply involved in researching and investigating the uh, very dark events related to my Empire of the Wheel books. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're, I, I would agree with you. Synchronicity is not always, you know, it, it, it well, look, uh, several years back, remember when angels were popular with people, right? Uh -huh. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you would have a lot of people going around out there saying things like, oh, I believe in angels, but I don't believe in demons. And mm -hmm. of course, for which I would yeah. laugh. Oh, really? Do you now? You know, um, because if, if, if you're going to believe one or accept one, you can't deny the other. And it, I think that fits with synchronicity. Just like you said, it's, you're not always being given information that you're right it is you know this wonderful positive thing sometimes very often you're given information that uh, i would dare say you might need to know to avoid dangers or or bad decisions or to protect yourself right something. so so that brings us to a whole other um topic which is is this happening outside of you is this them or guides or spirit or God or mm. angels, or is it coming from within us because of our connection to everything, the, right. the collective unconscious, which I tend, tends to be how I see things. But um, I wanted to add this that, and I was looking for this earlier, that Gary Sparks, the way he explains it, he says, our understanding of reality is inadequate. So just to boil everything I said down to, <laughs> to one sentence, our understanding of reality is inadequate, that matter and spirit don't operate separately. They are a unity. Mm -hmm. And you see that unity in a synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's what science can't come to grips with, right? They don't, they don't want to see it that right. it's a unity. They want to see it as it's separate. Oh, and of course. Yeah. yeah. So, so I don't know that when I, earlier, when I said, get to the bottom of it, I think that there are a lot of obstacles in the way. There's a lot of uh, pushback with this. And just as there is in the UFO community with taking this seriously and using science to look at it, there's so much pushback because it's like, we don't, there, there, there's factions out there that don't want it to be real, that don't want it to be normalized because what's it going to do? It's going to shatter some of the myths that a lot of us hold or sure. beliefs that a lot of us have. And what's this going to do to religions? You know, that, that's mm -hmm. such a big thing that, I keep mentioning, and I don't think that many people are taking that into consideration. Oh, There's so, some of those big names in the UFO community are not taking into consideration that there are a lot of people that are not happy about this. Right, right. Well, and, and let's not forget when we talk about religions, let's not forget about the religions of academia and the religions of science, because yeah. you know, what we're talking about here, they're just as devoted it, it is like a religion um you know to to the people who would deny the external on this but uh, uh, i've personally been convinced of the external um uh, source involvement in these things um in 2010 <clears throat> i saw the image of a figure um on on a mountainside now not like a person standing there it was like it was like a a th their image kind of um burned into the the terrain so to speak and burned is just the w best word i can use um 
I was alone on that particular day, but because four years later, when I had my UFO experience, there was another witness standing there with me seeing the object himself. So it wasn't just, you can't argue, well, that UFO was in your mind if it's all this synchronicitous stuff. Well, no, it wasn't in my mind because the other witness was seeing exactly what I was seeing. Well, so, no, that, that brings us to something we haven't gotten into Jung's uh, essay yet on flying saucers, but that gets to something that he mentions in that essay, which is that he was with several other people, uh, I think it was during a seance, and they could see an orb uh, sort of a look like the moon hovering above uh, the the medium's body mm. and he couldn't see it so I've mm. often I, I've never seen a, a, a UFO in the classic sense of the word I've mm. seen lots of things n none of them that I would classify as a UFO, but I've not ever been with people that were seeing a UFO either. Ah, okay. So, but that's an issue as to it, just because there are several people, one or more, or mm. more than one, let's say, just because there's more than one, more than one observer mm -hmm. that can see this physical object. Mm -hmm. So if it was an internal thing if it was a hallucination then the person standing next to you wouldn't be able to see it right but if the person standing next to you can see it and you can see it but then a third person on the other standing on the other side of you can't see it what's that what's going on there and Good Jung question. brings that up yes in his essay and has no answer for that well let's jump over to uh Jung on ufos okay so, like a good segue time so uh, I do want to say that just so that people uh, who are interested know that this book, some people call it a book because just like I was talking about Jung's essay on synchronicity being uh, included in volume eight of his collected works, but also published separately as a book, same mm -hmm. with Jung's essay on flying saucers. It's actually an essay it's titled Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Skies, and it is included in volume 10 of his collected works, which is titled Civilization in Transition. But Flying Saucers, the essay, is also published individually as a book, and it is in many printings printed by different printing houses. And the one that I love that I have, I'm, I'm holding it right now. I have the hardcover edition. I believe it's still available. And it's the translation by RFC Hall. It is the not only the essay, Flying Saucers, from uh, volume 10, it also includes this, uh, this extract from volume 18, which is, is the last volume of Jung's collected works um, because volume 19 is a bibliography and volume 20 is an index. Volume 18, it's huge. It's titled uh, The Symbolic Life and it has all these miscellaneous writings. And there is a letter that Jung wrote, a letter to Donald Kehoe and Anybody in the UFO community is going to be familiar with that name, Major Donald E. Kehoe. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do I want to say? So this hardcover edition that was published in 1978, I think, by MJF Books um, is great. And it has a lot of illustrations in it as well. And it has the paragraph numbers. Um, no, this one doesn't have illustrations. There are paperback yeah there are illustrations in here i'm sorry there are paintings and dreams and um these famous um these famous i don't know artworks from the 1500s that depict what appear to be ufos in the sky and sure. walter as i've told you many times uh, 
you know I've been part of the UFO community since the 1980s when I lived in Cleveland and I used to go to meetings once a month. Cleveland has uh, what they say is the oldest continually, uh, continually, what's the word where people have been going every year for years? Gathering. What's that? Gathering gathering meeting yeah yeah it's it's not ever stopped once it was formed this group has continually has been continuous i'm a little lightheaded sorry i didn't eat i didn't eat lunch i should have eaten lunch before we started and so every time we talk i say the same thing okay <laughs> so uh i used to go to those meetings back in the 1980s um my boyfriend at the time when I was in college, read Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, and it scared the hell out of him. And we both got interested in UFOs. And so he found out about, it's called CUP, the Cleveland Ufology Project, and they still exist. And we would go once a month to these UFO meetings. And Whitley Strieber's friend, Raven Dana, came to speak one month. And Whitley's book, Transformation, had just come out. And so she had just gotten back from the cabin. Whitley's, you know, the famous cabin where he had all of his experiences. And mm -hmm. I was mesmerized. She said that she was sitting in the bed and a being came in the window and touched her hand. I mean, I believed everything I heard back then. I mean, mm -hmm. I just believed it because I thought, well, why, why would she make that up? I don't mm -hmm. believe any of it today. <laughs> okay, none of it. Right. <laughs> I see this thing so differently now. So that was like 1989. So uh, Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Skies. I don't recommend this book, I have to say, because mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's no information in here that is usable. I mean, Jung looks at this from a psychological perspective and mm -hmm. there's really not much to say because he has no idea what's going on. So he goes over dream. Well, first of all, he talks about UFOs as rumors because yeah. he does take this seriously. And that's one of the things about Jung that, that really attracted me to this field is that he takes everything seriously. He, if it's a product of the psyche, it's important to him. And you know, he lived a really long life and he was trained as, as a psychiatrist and got his medical degree and worked until, um, you know, he died. <laughs> he died when he was 85. He was almost <laughs> 86. I think he was a few weeks away from turning 86. And he worked up until the end and he traveled all over the world. And so what I'm why that's important is because he had a lot of experiences and he knew a lot of people and he knew Einstein and, and you know, and Pauli and he had a lot of influences and this huge library. And so he had a lot of experiences of, from which he developed his theories, okay, and his psychology. So he wrote this essay because he knew this was going on and and i think the date is very important so the essay he finished it and published it in german in 1958 and then it was translated into english in the following year in 1959. so let's look at that time period roswell happened in 1947. Mm -hmm. so roswell had already happened but it's still only 11 years later that he mm. publishes this book it, it, nobody knew what was going on and also wait a minute roswell happened in 47 but the information about it didn't come out until much later right correct most of uh, what gets talked about and and what is known um yeah other than those initial when you know, things were going down at the moment within the, you know, the, the, the days around the time it was happening, those newspaper. The reports. newspaper, yeah, with the flying yeah, disc. That's really, and, and I mean, we could, we could have a whole hours long discussion on, you know, that 
part of the fact that it, it, what when we say most of what is known, you know, how much of it is true and accurate? There's been so much BS. Well, that, the, yeah, the, so the myth around Roswell. Exactly. The, the myth, we can say, you're right, did not emerge until decades after, it, it, you know, whatever happened. Because there's no mention, this makes sense now, I, I guess I hadn't put this together, there's no mention of Roswell in this essay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so there, the, and, and I've talked to analysts, and I'm still talking to analysts about this essay, mm -hmm. and I still want to do you know, a, a, an episode that just of my podcast that just focuses on this, but, and I do have somebody lined up, but there are not a lot of people that, not a lot of analysts that want to talk about this, but they are being, so what happens in Jungian analysis is you go for your analytic hour and you bring material and dream material uh, you having dreams and writing them down is something that analysts like to work with. So I have heard that they're getting a lot of UFO dreams. And so mm -hmm. Jung does have several chapters in this book. Let's call it a book now. This essay was published as a book on dreams. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I don't, so I'm, I, decided not to become a clinician. I've never wanted to be a clinician. I don't find that type of work suits me. I'm not interested in that sort of thing. And so reading over and over about all these dreams, I just, that's just not my thing. So there's a lot of dream material in this essay, but it starts with addressing the rumors. And I think that really, it's important to keep in mind that Jung says, as a psychiatrist, he can only speak on the, the psychic aspects, the psychological aspects of this. So that's what he's looking at. He's looking at this from a psychological perspective. And that to me is important because to me, that's what's missing in the UFO community is that they're not looking at this psychologically. And I don't know why. And I actually brought this up to someone who, I don't care, I'm just going to say it, someone who has a contact in the intelligence community, mm -hmm. who's being fed information, given information, uh, coached, uh -huh. quite literally, I said, tell him that I said that you can't ignore the psychology Mm -hmm. the, 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 look at these individuals who are out there, the, 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 the voices, the big voices in the UFO community. Mm -hmm. I keep hearing and seeing the same people. I mean, you've been to the conferences too. I've been to the Conscious Life Expo, Contact mm -hmm. in the Desert, Alien Con. Mm -hmm. I started listening to Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell back in the 1990s. Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. I've been to Whitley's Dreamland Festival. I've mm -hmm. been with Whitley on many occasions, actually. Right. It's the same people spouting the same stuff. And exactly. these people, we don't know what's going on with these people psychologically. Right. I mean, in analysis, what Jungian analysts do is they conduct analysis on people. That takes years. I was in analysis for 17 years. There's that Inter number again. No. <laughs> there's that number again and exactly. when i told barbara davies that she said that makes sense that's the number of completion so these people who were all just sort of s s what sitting at their knee or at their feet yes hearing what do they have to say next and i don't mm. want to name names but we all know who they are mm -hmm. the ufo celebrities yes the luminaries yeah. the luminaries I don't trust these people as far as I can throw them because the the more I listen and the more aware I become and the more my eyes are opened, the less I the less credibility they have. Have these people been analyzed? Do they know if they're projecting? Right. No. They don't. Well, I, I think one of the one of the problems that in this specific uh, issue you're talking about that we run into in the ufology community and in, in, in the, the, the the bigger macrocosm of 
you know society out there is that um it, it seems like there's two kinds of people as regards you have uh, people that are comfortable with their individuality and then you have people that are the more collectivist minded people and the collectivist minded people they they have this just this uh, ceaseless need to relate to others they have to be part of a group and we see this in this particular issue the reason people you know sit at the feet of the luminaries and um, listen to the same things and want to hear their stuff over and over is because they want to be part of a, a particular crowd right and when you go telling them hey you know it's not that you're not having experiences but yeah. your experiences might be unique to you yes. there are people that don't want to hear that yeah. they because they're collective minded and, and they, the, the idea of individuality scares them. And in, in their minds, they think if, it, if, if it's uh, uh, unique to them, their experience, it, somehow that lessens the experience. Which or is... that then they have to do something with it. So uh, when yeah. you're in a group, then you, there's sort of a shared responsibility. But right. if it's, a, if it's a, an experience that's unique to you and mm -hmm. says something about you, Right. then that's scary. You, then yeah. you you have to take responsibility for your own psyche. And it's, people like embrace that scariness. I mean, to us, that's not scary. To us, that's illumination. That's, oh, great. Now I know what to do because ultimately we are action oriented, right? And we really want to know what to do with ourselves and our lives. So but I think that's kind of rare because here's what I've come up against in the field that I'm in mm -hmm. is that Jung, Jung, the real Jung will never be popular. It will never be part of the collective. Okay? Uh, the, the, the bullshit Jung, the, the pe that's why I'm so careful with who I interview. There are people out there who are talking about Jung. They've cherry picked Jung. They've read a bit of Jung and then they're out there with loud voices they're extroverts, they've got huge YouTube channels, and so they have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of views. These people have no credibility, but the average person who's just typing in Jung in the search field on YouTube is not gonna know that this person has no credibility. That's why I do five minute intros on my guests talking about their background, their education, their experience, their publications, Mm -hmm. And also Jungian analysts have been analyzed. Somebody like Jordan Peterson, who's written best-selling books about, about his interpretation of Jung, he's never been analyzed. Mm. That guy in the Jungian community has absolutely no credibility whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But he has a cult-like following. So... I just, I don't want to completely dismiss this essay because there's some important things here, but j j mm -hmm. I just want to finish that. What I was saying was the, that I run up against that same issue that we're running up against in the UFO community is that very few people want to do the work on themselves. Right. It's so much easier to blame somebody else to right. put the responsibility on somebody else mm -hmm. and to wait for somebody else to do it, to find it, to fix it, to solve it, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we learn in Jungian analysis, the integration, the responsibility that we take for ourselves. And we also learn about projection what mm -hmm. am I not owning? So what am I projecting onto other people, places, things, governments, institutions that I'm not owning myself? So that's what I'm seeing. I love being part of the UFO community. I'm still interested. I'm as interested today as I was back in the 80s. I'm just not believing everything I'm hearing. I think there's something going on, but I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. and I want to find out. So I'm not leaving, you know, because I'm still curious. Right. So, and, mm -hmm. and of us who question 
the popular myths and the popular narrative, um, you know, those people would love for us to go away. In fact, a lot of times they scream and yell and make a loud noise to discourage, you know, any questioning of, of their dogma. But you know what? We shouldn't go away, those of us who question that. We need to hold our ground and make our voice, you know, have our voices in the mix um, because there's so much BS that, um, you know, well, is look at, where, look at where we are. It was just the anniversary of Roswell, the 70, what, 75th anniversary of Roswell. Yeah, and fifth. look how far we've come. We still don't know. Yeah. We, we, it, 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 people will say they'll, they'll react. They'll be emotional. They'll say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. We've learned so much. And yet if you sit down with them, <laughs> You can point out where this so much that they swear we've learned is either based on lies or, or, or you know, uh, poor memory and, and this, that and the other. But then what do they do? They just reject it wholesale. You know, they, they because they there are people who have just decided what they want to believe about that particular issue. And they're just stubbornly, you know, going to cling to that and you you just you're not going to change their minds what's going to have to happen is there something something very personal for them is going to have to happen before they would change their minds so um you know. so i i want to go back to flying saucers um mm -hmm. the the essay so yes. that i can just i can just mention a few things these mm -hmm. are you know young is not easy to read and I find that for myself but I also hear analysts say that which makes me feel a lot better Jung mm -hmm. is not easy to read it's difficult and his theories are complex they're they, they are they're they're complicated and Jungians have not been it's not been a priority to them to take Jung out into the world and I kind of came across this or I came up against this when I was trying to book guests is mm -hmm. analysts say that they do their work one-on-one -on -one in mm -hmm. the analytic container, which is sort of an alchemical term. It, it's the, the, the analytic crucible when you and your analyst are sitting alone in a room Mm -hmm. That is a container that is a safe place. And that's where things heat up and transformation takes place. So having an analyst speak publicly was kind of frowned upon. And it's been quite difficult getting guests. Most of the analysts I ask to record episodes with me say no. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to mention that. But some of them are extroverted. And the ones who have published books and are more extroverted, are more willing to do episodes with me. So um, Jung's theories, uh, I think, are, they're so relevant today. He was way ahead of his time. And so getting back to uh, the essay, um, what did I want to say about this? That, it, it, that it's, it's difficult for me to explain. Mm -hmm. Um, he, as I said, was more concerned, not with whether or not UFOs are real, but, but with their psychic aspect. So what right. does this mean for this person? Right. Like I was, I was talking to my analyst the other day because we still chat on the phone and I said, you know, what do you think's going on with the, these people who really believe they've been abducted by aliens? And she said, well, I would look at it as we do in analysis, I would look at it symbolically. What, what I would, I would wonder, what do they mean by abducted? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? So, and, and what is, what is alien is what is other. So that's another thing we do in analysis. Jung's concept of individuation stems from the psyche being a multiplicity within a unity and that we are actually divided within ourselves. We are, we, we have all these different aspects of ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. so in analysis, what we do is we bring those 
different parts of us together mm -hmm. uh, to create some sense of wholeness. So it's individuation is about the movement away from being so divided within ourselves. Um, because Jung was really, really big on wholeness. He said that we all have a very deep longing for wholeness. And that's, that's what really what he was about. And so, um, back to the essay, mm -hmm. he, he believed that we were going through this change as a society. And there's some debate on this, but I did an episode with an analyst who said that Jung was the first to use the term, the age of Aquarius. And so he said that we were moving into a different age and mm -hmm. that that would uh, bring with it changes in the archetypes or the gods in the collective psyche. See, Jung believed that there were, this is where he differs from Freud. One of the places where he differs from Freud is that Jung believed that there are two layers to the unconscious. There's the personal unconscious and there's the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that collective unconscious is what I believe is makes remote viewing possible because that matrix field that, mm -hmm. that we tap into um, when we're viewing to me, that's the collective unconscious, which is the impersonal, the transpersonal level of the psyche mm -hmm. that is not conscious, but it's common to everyone. It's common to all of humanity, that level of the psyche. That, and and, mm -hmm. and I th it's also the, the, the thing that people um, uh, confuse w w when they say that there is no individuality, that, you know, we're all just facets of the one collective mind, that I, I, which I disagree with. Um, I think what they're doing is mischaracterizing what you are talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. And that's where I differ from my Buddhist friends. So, part of the individuation process where we are divided and the process is to bring those parts together into some sense of wholeness uh, and which gets into Jung believed that seeing these flying saucers, which back then people were seeing, that's what they were called, right? They were called mm. flying saucers because people were seeing saucer shaped objects and now we're seeing triangles and tic tacs. But Jung saw the UFO or the, the flying saucer as a mandala, which is, is a, a circle, which is a symbol of wholeness. And so he believed that when we were uh, in these times of crisis, that's when, that's when these, these psychic products would come up mm -hmm. and, and we, how do I say this? We, these unconscious, not unconscious, but conscious fantasies that mm -hmm. we have is what gave us the interpretation that this is an alien, that this is a craft from another world, that this mm -hmm. is not of this world. This right. is, this is not human. That's speculation. That's fabrication. That's fantasy that is projection because there is no evidence unless i'm missing something no evidence that these machines or these plasma balls or whatever these lights are from another planet where'd they get that idea um they get it from a lifetime of in our times in our era in the last hundred years especially let's say they get it from a lifetime of exposure to stories of these very Thank things you. yes movies tv yes. of course so farther back literature and radio right and uh, that's where people in fact i'm going to be discussing that very thing at the san diego comic-con this week oh, um, both in fact and fiction and i talk about that very thing and show examples of where some of these ideas in our times emerged. Mm -hmm. And um, another another big point that Jung is addressing in this essay is why 
it seems desirable that that UFOs are real. He's looking at that psychologically. Why mm-hmm. do people like you? You have more experience with this than I do. That you run up against these people who are fanatical about defending the existence of UFOs or the validity of them. You know, I don't you, know what yeah, they are, right. and I, I'm mm-hmm. at the point where I don't think that they're from another world. Right. I don't think that they're from off planet. I think that they may be interdimensional or from somewhere else on this planet, but from another planet? Come on. The, the, no. the, the, yeah, the issue that I have come to have with the idea that it's, you know, the, the jumping to the ET conclusion is that, um, it, you know, the examples we have, certain activities of intelligent beings, is our own history. Now, when we were when we opened up, say, the what they called the New World, the Americas for the Age of Exploration, um, they didn't do this furtive, hiding, non-disclosed um, arrival here. Oh, on the contrary, they planted flags. They made a big show of it. They're like, hey, we're here. Yeah. And my view is, is that when you've crossed the vastness of space, right, from your, your uh, inhabited world to another world, inhabited world why be so furtive and sneaky and in non disclosure well you know they have answers for that 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 of course of well, course yeah. they do right that All they're really that bad. they're watching us from a distance they don't sure. want to interfere yeah. those are myths yeah. guess those where are they... myths based on projections and this is why it's important to be analyzed so you know whether or not you're projecting because well, what you don't know about yourself you will project onto other people I, this concept of they don't want to interfere with us, you, you know, that mostly comes from, you'll love this, from Star Trek. There, and oh, Star- I didn't watch Star Trek. Yeah, they had this thing called the Prime Directive that they talk about. Of course, Kirk and them are violating it constantly every other episode. But the Prime Directive of the Federation was you do not interfere with so these. So that's directives. a human concept yes so that's another thing that's the 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 big the big bold letters in my notes i wrote stop attributing human attributes to them unless unless they actually be human and i that's something that i've come to suspect is that there are human other human beings exactly like us but see to me to me i'm not on board with that because i believe i believe i know Mm -hmm. some of my friends don't believe you're mm-hmm. not the only one. I believe that humans are of the earth because okay. we're made up of mostly water and we right. breathe oxygen and that's what we've got here on earth. Right. And, and just because there might be another planet with ah. with the same kind of water and the same kind of air, mm-hmm. we our bodies can't handle the space travel. And that's an excellent point. So you know, how, well, that? Oh, oh, but they say, but it's instantaneous, but it's a wormhole. Do you know that the human body can endure that? Can, can the human body endure a wormhole or dematerialization and rematerialization? I don't think so. But remember that um, the human body can't endure uh, unprotected high altitude. And, and with our technology, what did we create? We created pressure suits so that the human body can go to high altitude and in outer space and survive. So Right, but we've only gone, what, 250,000 miles out? That's how far the moon is? We haven't yeah. gone b- beyond the moon. Yeah, as far as we know, you're right. It's only a quarter of a million miles. So, um um, but, you know, how much different would open space be um, than the, the, you know, those 250,000 miles between here and the moon, right? So, it, and it's because a Because there's no air, but, so, so we right. had to create a vehicle so that we can breathe inside the vehicle? Yeah, they would, it, but. What with, about the radiation? You know, what, you there, there's, not, okay. We will develop that. We'll develop some way to recycle you know, the air to where that, that won't be a problem. But Maybe why haven't we? Our lifetime. We went well, to the moon 50 years ago. Why haven't we developed anything to go further? Uh, and that's why I always like to throw in as far as we know, because you're right. What the heck have we been doing? Because yeah. of the, see, you, you say as far as we know, because of the secret space program, do you really think, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being facetious. I, I mean, I don't know. Do you really think human beings could keep that secret? 
Yes, if if the operations okay. are limited, that we're not. And this is why I have argued when that subject comes up, these people have these ridiculous stories and ideas of some something like Starfleet, you know, in the movies where there's these massive ships and this big secret complete. No, 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 no. Any any when you hear me talking about SSP or, or I prefer to say classified manned space operations, from my perspective, it's it's much more limited than that. And therefore, because it would be much more limited, it's much easier to keep that a secret. If we had some if we had some big fleet of giant starships, there's no way in hell we'd be able to yeah. keep that for, for well, very long. So I want to talk a little bit more about Jung's essay, but yeah, I want to, but no, but no, but since yeah. we're on, since we're on secrecy, I want to talk a little bit about UFO secrecy, if that's okay, because sure. I'm not on board with disclosure. So as, as you know, I actually, I, I had a long talk with Stephen Bassett when I was in Los Angeles last year, uh, he met me and we sat for drinks and we had a long conversation and he is the disclosure guy, right? So he is lobbying for UFO disclosure. He believes it's going to happen. He's been saying that for years. Right. And he thinks that people can handle it. People. Do you know how different people are? People mm -hmm. in general can handle it and would be happy about it. I don't see it that way at all. I don't think that, well, you can't generalize, but I don't believe that society, society as we know it, could stay afloat if this were, if disclosure happened. And right. I don't believe disclosure will happen because what is disclosure? The United States government coming forward with information? Why haven't the Chinese come forward with it? Why haven't the Russians? Right. Why haven't, why hasn't any other country come forward with proof that extraterrestrials are visiting us and that we're in communication with them. What, because they have right. a pact with the U.S.? Please, what are we going to do, blow them up if they come forward with it? Well, let's look at, let's say that things in our mythologies and various ancient scriptures and such, let's say these reflect when the alleged gods come out of the skies. Um, uh, let, let's say this re reflects the arrival of extraterrestrials. Well, they weren't furtive and secretive about it either. They were very, you know, here we are and now we are your gods, blah, 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 so forth. So why do these people think that when these beings come again, that they would be so quiet and, and, and you know, secretive about it? Um, you know, I've been saying for a while that disclosure, you know, that's not something that humans are going to die. It, it could be whatever these beings, creatures, and things are, they don't want to be disclosed. And when you look at it from the perspective we're discussing today, it makes even more sense that there's not going to be disclosure because this is something that when, um, you know, various researchers will say uh, that uh, they have been with us a long time. Well, that's definitely true from a Jungian perspective like we're talking here because if it does have to do with these not that it's not real not that it can't externalize but if it does have to do with um, these uh, in, in connected with these internal issues that we have as individuals of course it's been with us for a long time it's been with us ever since we yes started to exist right right it's a part of our reality and our experience mm -hmm. and um, you know, when I, I do think that extraterrestrials have been here, I think they're going to return. And but when they do, when they do, it's going to be a very open thing. I, I mean, you, you know, they're I don't think they're going to want to hide from us. You, you know why I don't believe that anymore? Because I've been part of the UFO community since the 1980s. I'm trying to remember what year it was. It had to have been huh? the first time I started going to Cleveland Ufology Project meetings was it had to have been 1980 seven mm -hmm. because I moved to Cleveland at the end of 1986 and mm -hmm. it was at the end. And then I met my friend there, uh, in 87 mm -hmm. and he lived on the West side and I lived on the East side and he would drive over to the East side, pick me up, and <laughs> drive back over to the West side. It was in Parma Heights or Parma, Ohio. And what did I want to say? Uh, what were we just talking about? The, 
disclosure. The, uh, the disclosure and whether ETs, you know, would uh, be open or would they hide themselves and on and so forth. There's so so eighty seven. This is over thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to these these stories and following along. Mm -hmm. No, right. No. Nope. Well, that's I'm more inclined to be intrigued with because my personal experience has been that it's something other than extraterrestrials. Nothing I've experienced um, has shown me or convinced me or says to me that it has anything to do with beings from other planets. There's no proof, but you know what there is? There are a lot yeah. of TV shows, magazines, right. mm -hmm. and uh, movies, and comic books. All of that, and yeah. even I actually talked to um, Hoagland about this. Mm -hmm. So I was born in 1965. I grew up with watching. I didn't watch what my brother and my dad were watching. I didn't watch Star Trek, and, right. and I watched Lost in Space. Mm -hmm. And but what I want to say is, even shows that didn't that were not science fiction, like The Brady Bunch had a UFO episode. The Flintstones had a little green Martian. The Great Kazoo, yeah. Yes, and my favorite Martian, that show. So, sure. and is this Brookings? Is this what was outlined in the Brookings report? You know, Andrew Let's, Curry and I talk about how we're Brookings babies. Yeah. Let's not forget also uh, uh, the TV movie, um, The UFO Incident, which is the Betty and Barney Hill encounter story that um, was one of the early depictions, if not the first, of the essentially the gray alien. And when you go, I'm talking about, I'm mentioning that this weekend in my talk at Comic-Con. Um, when you go back and, if you go back and watch that movie, and, and of course, you know, if you're familiar with the Betty and Barney Hill encounter, mm -hmm. um, you see in that film uh, things that became that and and remain, uh, you know, the popular tropes and dogma of ufology today, and uh, the Same, idea, right? Same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and also the idea that there is no threat from space, and that they're all peaceful, and they love us, and and on and so forth. It's interesting how we're told that the if my if i'm remembering the timeline right here the the supposed von braun uh they call it the deathbed confession but he, mm -hmm. my understanding is he didn't actually say it on his deathbed but that emerged in the late se that apparently happened um mm -hmm. in the late 70s and I, i'm trying to remember if it happened before or after for example the film close encounters well he i thought he died in the early 70s i'm gonna look right here and maybe maybe he did i i was i was thinking the the mid to late 70s but but the point i'm getting at is oh you're it, right yeah sorry to interrupt you he died in 77 77 okay yeah so so close encounters i don't know if it had come out yet or not but um we a lot of a lot of the sentiment and the the tropes of modern ufology, specifically with the peaceful ET, um, we can and I say this in a lighthearted manner. We can blame Steven Spielberg because between Close Encounters and ET came out in seventy seven too. Yeah, exactly. And then ET in eighty two. Think about the people today that just vehemently will tell you that the ETs are all peaceful and loving and, and there's no threat and there's no danger. These are people that, these were two huge movies for them. You know, we're in the same age range, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, loved Close Encounters. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, ET, it was, that was the beginning of my, you know, ah, this is kind of a semi-kids movie. You know, I was in college and stuff. But but it, it those two films, I am you know, I believe and I see where they had a huge impact on the psyche yeah. of uh, uf the ufology community today. Because, and then when you throw in the, and again, I'm not trying to say this in an incendiary um, uh, fashion, um, spirit, but, you know, I question the popular assumptions about the so-called von braun um 
uh, revelation or, mm -hmm. or deathbed confession, so to speak. Um, uh, either the the specific interpretation of what he was actually saying, or or honestly, we have to question because there's only one witness whether he said it at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you combine that with with the folks having grown up with close encounters and their happy little childlike ETs, and then ET itself, the movie, um, well, that got imprinted in the minds of a lot of you know current day adults at a very young age and you are not going to um you know it's going here's what it's going to take here's what it's going to take it's going to take one of those very unique and deeply personal um uh uh in, internal illuminations or um uh, what's what's the word for enlightenment um that uh you know will reflect what we've been talking about from the Jungian perspective before these people will even question the ones who that was deeply imprinted on before they will question. It, it was deeply imprinted on them. And I'm wondering, I always want to take it a step further or go underneath that. So what was behind those mo movies, all the movies we're talking about and the great gazoo and the Flintstones and my favorite Martian and all of that, what was who, what, or who was behind all of that? Right. Was that um, just in the collective psyche at the time, or was that I think it was, was it? Sorry. I think it was both. I think what you're you're saying. It, 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 I think it was what was brewing in the collective psyche, and at the same time, someone could easily have um, taken advantage of what was brewing in the collective society to um, steer that's you know our society in in this particular direction and then the narrative of roswell when did that what year did that come out because 1980 was when the myth really emerged 1980 so if close encounters came out in 77 and then yeah. three years later this story <laughs> about a flying saucer with alien bodies crashed in the desert and yeah. Yeah. and then they in the movie independence day all of that stuff right this all seems like one big, I don't want to say it, you say it. Well, it, 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 um, uh, a, a, a false narrative for, um, perception management. It, re recall, um, and I talk about this in my book, Shimmering Light, yeah. that my dad, I first heard about the, the, essentially the Roswell story in 1974. Now, before it was made public. Yeah, before it's made public, and there were people hearing murmurings. That's why uh, Stanton Friedman and um, you know that the amazing Cal Korf, who you know has done things apparently since he was four years old, and I, and I don't say that in a mean spirit because I like a lot of Cal's work, but it, it's it, I mean he literally was around since he was a teenager around the Roswell thing because he became acquainted with Stanton Friedman. But um, yeah, they were looking into it starting in the mid to late 70s um but it was something that was out there but it, it was kind of brought all together and crystallized in the book the roswell incident which was released in 1980 but in my book shimmering light i mm -hmm. when i deep dive into my dad's story and in the context of when he was in the air force and what was going on what i've come to is this whole roswell narrative okay could have been emerged out of a false narrative relative to what was being done with MK Ultra, and I go into that in in my book, and I've talked about that elsewhere. I won't belabor that here, but uh, the the whole popular Roswell ET crash myth, and people, I guarantee you, there's going to be somebody hearing this is just going to be angry, angry that um, you know I'm saying this that we're we're yeah. so. You know, the, there, there are listeners to speaking of Jung, they're listening to a PhD Jungian analyst talk and they get angry and disagree. Oh, yeah. So oh, you know, that's yeah. about them. It's not about you know, the material. You, you, it's not about us. About, it's about them. Yeah. You talked about responsibility of the individual as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, speaking of my book, Shimmering Light, uh, in that book, I, and this is a habit that I have with, like, I'm very honest when I'm speculating, when I'm hypothesizing. I make it clear when I'm doing that, mm -hmm. okay? I present my research, my analysis. I, I present 
what I think, you know, some of my tentative conclusions or my hypotheses. But ultimately, I believe in letting the reader, you know, or the person listening to me decide for themselves. And when I released Shimmering Light, one of the reviews I got was from um, a, a, a lady. I don't know if she's a young lady or older lady, but um, uh, and she was like, I detected anger. It bothered her that I didn't tell her what to think about all this, that she specifically criticized and complained that I did not, you know, you know, it was her attitude was what was the point of the book if I wasn't going to tell literally she said something I'm paraphrasing, but if yeah. I wasn't gonna tell her what to think about this, and I'm like, wow. Are tell me what to think. Wow. Think yeah. for yourself. Exactly. You know, thank you. And, um, and, 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 uh, she just proved my point as to why we try to get people to think for themselves. It's like you're getting angry and you're acting like you're this enlightened person that I'm supposed to be telling you what to think. But that's quite the opposite of probably how she perceived herself. Mm -hmm. you know, she probably perceives herself as a very enlightened person. You know, tell me, you know, I, let me tell you what you're supposed to do as a researcher writer. And it's like, no, 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 no. Do your own work. Do your own thought work delve into these things um as i think young would say is get to know yourself and and really um you know it comes down to the idea of of you know it's an old saying it's it's an old golden rule kind of thing you know everybody's plate you know of their own issues is pretty full mm -hmm. and and this is where the virtue of minding your own business comes in if mm -hmm. if if more people would focus on the crap that's on their own plates. Yes. They would be less busybody about other people mm -hmm. and tell But it's other easier to focus on what's wrong with somebody else instead right. of looking at what's wrong that's with you. Right. That's it's right. Easier. That's where that's where my personal view, I I personally am convinced that reincarnation is a real thing. And to me, these people just are on the endless wheel and they'll never get off because it's always you know, or maybe this is their first time around in physical life or what have you. But yeah, it's, it's always someone else that needs to enlighten them and tell them. And, and when you do that, and I've said this before, you're robbing the person listening to your account. You're robbing them of that personal growth and transformation and development that they would get through getting out there and living these experiences themselves. But again, in this community, ufology community we're talking about, um, these people just want to live vicariously and they think they're going to get all the same gnosis and wisdom from that just hearing accounts. And, and, and these are the people who, you know, include those who get upset that, you know, when people just kind of get saturated with these storytellers you know, and say, hey, enough of the storytellers, let's, you know, go about this, you know, and with using different tools and, and different angles. They get angry about that. It's like, oh, you're trying to silence people. It's like, no, but when you've heard 10,000 accounts of basically the same thing, that's, you know, there's two things that should be going through your mind. It, it's number one, okay, do I need to hear another 10,000 to get the point? I get the point. But then, the other question, and this comes back to the Jungian discussion, mm -hmm. if if we keep hearing account after account, you know, ten thousands of accounts that are essentially very similar, the same thing, the people having these experiences or sharing these accounts, they should be thinking, wait a minute, this sounds like something like we're talking about that all human beings go through individually, not some encounter with aliens from another world it it sounds like something that is a very uh, uh common human experience and mm -hmm. they they want to have they want to be like children they want it to be et they want it to be the cute little alien right, and that that's what needs to be looked at is that uh, desire what uh -huh. are, what is it that so this this is how what i said earlier about jungian analysts working one-on-one -on -one. you right. can't work with a group of people because mm. the, it's made up of individuals with different needs and right. different issues. Right. So you can't work as a group. Uh, you have to work one-on-one. -on -one. And so one of the other things I wanted to say that I only <laughs> glossed over is when we were talking about, are these aliens from another planet? Well, what 
what the Jungians would say is, well, what is alien? What is this other that you're right. confronting that is visiting you? Because I, I don't believe I've been visited by an alien, but you and I both know plenty of people who have those stories that they were visited by an alien. Um, what is it that's visiting you? What is it that you see out there? Right. It's a it that if you haven't done the work on yourself, you don't know who you are. You don't know the different parts of yourselves. Right. You haven't explored your shadow. All this right. stuff is in you that you're not conscious of. It's in the unconscious. So the unconscious is constantly bleeding through mm -hmm. into the outside world. And so what is it that you're confronting here? And also seeing them as saviors, as help. Well, then you probably need a savior. So you're seeing this as a savior. You're that That's what would be explored with an analyst is what in you needs to be saved? What are you projecting onto this alien that you're disowning within yourself? And then, and, and you know, looking at what is it that you need? What is it that you're lacking? Because going back to the Jung's concept of wholeness, the psyche is always seeking wholeness. And that is the reason for everything. Right. Because it, it, something's out of balance. So it's seeking its opposite. It's seeking whatever's missing to create wholeness. And the dreams are compensatory. Mm -hmm. They compensate what, what's for you know what's lacking. So right. and, and they'll show you where you're being one sided. Mm -hmm. so, I think that ooh, yeah. I that too. Um, uh, people uh, will what you just said a, a moment ago about you, you know people are seeking wholeness, and the mistake too many people make is. They think they're going to find that wholeness through another person. Yeah, it's not about finding it outside of you. This is it, wholeness man. is about inside, and it's a yeah. lot of work. And these are the people who are obsessed with they got to have a relationship. They got to be in a relationship, and I I mean that 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 major <laughs> type of relationship. Right? It, it's they're obsessed with. They really believe that everybody needs that. They and it's because they crave it because they believe that's what they need and they'll give lip service to being solitary or solitude but when where the rubber meets the road they actually can't handle it because it means living with themselves yeah and, and being mated can be uh, you know you, you, and I'm saying this as, you know, I'm going to be 59 years old. You know, I've been married. I've lived with girlfriends. It, you know, I'm at a stage in my life where, you know, I can say what I'm saying and, and I'm confident about it. Of course, when I was in my 20s, like anyone else, you know, yeah, I wanted to be married to my first wife and, and on and so forth. But life has taught me and my experience in uh, uh, doing the homework on myself has brought me to this place where, you know, I'm not perfect. I got work to do, but I'm okay. I'm perfectly more than okay and quite happy with, you know, that being this individual and having, you know, this solitary existence where these kinds of things we're talking about right now are concerned. Now, do I live in my house alone? No, I have family, you know, that, that's here. I have my, you know, my, the, the daughter Liliana is here with her friends and, and stuff. So we have a family environment here, but, um, I, I don't need, um, the, uh, the, the, the intense, entanglement with another individual to feel whole mm -hmm. i can feel whole um you know just with me sitting there you know surrounded by my library and doing what it is that i do that's where my wholeness comes from mm. you know and your wholeness only you can know where your wholeness will come from and just like any individual but you know, there's some. There's a lot of folks out there that are obsessed with, you know, seeking that externally because, like you said, they they really, really doing the homework, really, really getting to know themselves and and truly individuating. It scares them. It they, scares they them. Don't... It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. But as you were speaking, it reminded me of one of the favorite episodes that I 
that I did was with an analyst who's, um, oh gosh, he's, uh, He's 82 years old now. He's not in the greatest health, but he's still out there working full time. And we did a, an episode about his book on relationships. It's called The Eden Project in Search of the Magical Other. In Search of the Magical Other, a Jungian perspective on relationship. And my biggest takeaway from that, and I had heard him say this years prior in a lecture, he said, mm -hmm. the question for you to ask is, what am I asking of this other person that I should be asking of myself. And he said that relationships are like the number one source of trouble in people's lives. Yes. <laughs> that he sees relationships. And so he said, always ask yourself, what is it that I'm asking of this other person that I should be asking of myself? And, uh, and that was my biggest takeaway. That's if anybody's interested, that's episode 27 on the Eden project. So, um, I just want to see, I'm looking to see if there was anything else about flying sa saucers. Uh, I feel like I gave it short shrift because I kind of glossed over it. It, it's oh. a, it. it is a difficult book. I know some people love the book. Uh, it's just not my dish. It's not my cup of tea. But I think that one of the things that I neglected to mention is mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and because and the reason why I neglected to mention this is because you remember earlier I was talking about the shape of the UFO uh, back then being mm -hmm. typically being a saucer shaped shape. And Jung saw that as a circle and he um, worked with mandalas. The red book is, has some of his paintings of mandalas and mandalas are, circles and they're symbols of wholeness so, because a circle is whole. And so he said that mandalas usually appear in situations of psychic confusion and perplexity mm -hmm. because the, the archetype that, that is constellated is a pattern of order. A circle mm -hmm. is order. And so he said that our time is characterized by fragmentation and confusion and perplexity. I mean, that was back then. Think about now. And that, um, that it's expressed in the psychology of the individual. And he's been, you know, observing these phenomena and his patients for decades for, and, and he's come to the conclusion that that archetype is of central importance and it gains importance to the degree that the importance of the ego is lost. So when we're, so let me just boil this down. When we're feeling like we're in times of trouble and confusion and war, uh, and we don't know who we are and the imp importance of the individual is lost and look what's happening with the Supreme Court. So we're looking for order. We're looking for salvation. Mm -hmm. not, maybe not consciously. So we're seeing these beings as saviors, so whatever we're, and, and where are the beings? I don't know. People are seeing beings. Has anybody seen a being and it, the being entered the room and a room of 500 people saw the same being? Has that ever happened? Nope. In spite of what, you know, stubborn people just to be, you know, a contrarian would want to be cute. But, but we hear, you know, Mark Sims say that, you know, he's at Stephen Greer's CE5 event and, and they, he goes into the hotel at night and he's laying in right. bed and this entity appears and he says he's from Tierra del Fuego and his name is Balthazar or whatever it is. And so that's <laughs> his account. Uh -huh. It's not like Balthazar came to the meditation circle Right. And introduced himself. So why is it, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not here to just, you know, beat up on him and criticize him, but I'm using it as an example as to this is about him and his psychological state. And mm. why is it that he is seeing something and projecting onto it these things? Right. So if he hasn't done that inner work, he doesn't know if he's projecting or not. So that's just the point I wanted to make. Sure. Well, you I don't. Know, want, I don't. I don't want to rip anybody. I just use that as an example. We're, we're we, and and we've been. Uh, it, we're probably approaching a good uh, stopping point. But I want to. I want to throw this in there before we get there. You mentioned. You know. Um, the 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 circle. The 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 flying saucer as something more than 
what we've been led to believe. Here's what's interesting about how the flying saucer emerged as what we were referring to UFOs as. Um, it goes back to the Kenneth Arnold sighting. And remember, he described um, more half moon or delta shaped type okay. craft. But he, he, the way he described their motion through the air was like a saucer skipping across. Skipping a rock across a pond. Now, here's what's interesting. And, mm -hmm. and then some journalist, we are told, started calling them, because of that, flying saucers. Now, we're presented this, the, 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 the conventional history that we're told is that that's how that happened. And it was kind of an accident how flying saucers. But go back. We, we we have since 1947, interesting that Arnold had his incident in 1947 before the so-called Roswell incident, right? Now, what we've learned since in the decades since then is something that a lot of people didn't know. Kenneth Arnold, we find out, um, what ha had an acquaintanceship with, you know, Jack Parsons and, and people in Parsons' uh, magical um uh -huh. social circles okay um and uh, so you have to what i'm trying to say is consider this could the flying saucer so to speak have been seeded into the you know the the collective psyche of our society by people who knew what they were doing in other words right. could arnold actually have been a little more active with the 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 Parsons type group and these kinds of things and you know the description of skipping across the water like a saw or to flying through the sky like a saucer skipping across the surface of water um you, you know w w was that something that he selected to get out there we have to ask ourselves who was we you know let's dive into that reporter or that journalist or whoever that that grabbed that flying saucer description mm -hmm. And, and first coined it or connected it with that, who was that guy? Did he have some connections or motive to put the flying saucer um, idea or what we would call meme into the collective consciousness of society? <clears throat> In other words, was this all some type of conscious um, uh, perception management right. thing played upon our society? Um, I, I think that's a worthy question. I think we have to ask ourselves that because of the things we're mm -hmm. talking about, the lack of evidence for all these things that people are just accepting. Lack of evidence. Yes. Thank you. You know, they're, they're accepting and they'll tell you it's a given. Well, everybody knows that these witnesses said this about Roswell. Well, yeah, everybody knows that they've heard that. But when you look closely, some of these witnesses didn't exist. Um, others, they were lying and admitted they were lying. Well, you're but just repeating what you've heard somebody else say. You're just I mean, repeating we, what you heard. We do that with other things. So when you look big picture, was the whole modern, has the whole modern UFO era mm -hmm. been a narrative to, um, for multiple reasons. Number one, the most practical grounded reason would be it coincided with the era of advanced aerospace technology emerging. We can't deny that. We can't just say, well, I don't want it to be that. And I'm tired of hearing that, so I'm going to ignore that. Well, boo-hoo, you can't change history in the context of history and, and on and so forth. But also, let's not forget that Jack Parsons had told the FBI that he firmly believed that a magic ritual he had done, I'm not sure if it's the one he did with L. Ron Hubbard or not, but a magic ritual he had done Parsons was convinced that whatever happened, if something weird happened at Roswell, he thought that he had opened some portal or gateway. We can't ignore that just because we want it to be the sweet little Spielbergian ETs. Um, you know, we have to we have to go back and rethink the modern UFO um, era, and I think it would behoove us to um, you know consider what Jung has to say on various things that we've been talking about today. And, and I would love to, if you, you know, want in the future, I'd love to have you back so we could dive more deeply into 
what again what young did and did not say about ufos and why you think it's valuable and and, and you know your opinion as to why it might not be as valuable as people in the community think it is yeah yep i i'm not as clear as mm -hmm. to what he said because i don't give it a lot of weight because of mm -hmm. the time that he wrote it and mm -hmm. it was before all this information came out right. so i've not really focused on his take on it except for what i shared about what mm -hmm. even even the term flying saucer i uh, as a jungian we would look at it symbolically well what mm -hmm. is a saucer you know, right. what are you what are people projecting onto these ufos right so and what Mm -hmm. and, and and was that image, that phrase, planted or seeded consciously into the you know society's collective awareness, because they were trying to uh, spark or kickstart a a transformation of um, the psyche of our society as a whole. There, there. That's a whole long discussion about um you know on th that we could have on that has somebody been playing has somebody been playing major mind games with the public psyche you know for the last 80 years and yeah, i wonder if it was intentional or not intentional right, right. if it wasn't intentional and our is popular ufo mythology just a part of that that's you know the thing that you know we we can talk about and consider but uh, anyway like i said we we've gone uh, over an hour and um i think this has been a great discussion i appreciate you coming on and talking about this and i and i want to do a, a part two you know as soon as we can but uh thank could, you could you thank you yeah. for for inviting me could i just wrap yeah. up with a a little bit more because i absolutely I, uh, okay i just still feel like i haven't adequately uh covered the essay so i just would like to add that at the end of jung's essay on flying saucers there is a summary and there's an epilogue and just just to go over it briefly just to show you what is really contained in this is he talks about the dreams and the paintings that he discusses throughout the essay and i don't know of what value that really has and just to talk about the masculine and the feminine with long and versus round objects and above and below the difference between heaven and earth and unity and quaternity. I mean, what, what is that really telling us about flying saucers and, and looking right. at solving what this phenomena really is and he's talking about the four functions and this again the this unity symbol over and over again and in the epilogue he talks about uh the secret of the saucers by mm -hmm. angelucci and fred hoyle's book the black cloud and john windham's the midwich cuckoos mm -hmm. so but really not getting anywhere with it just talking about myth and archetype and symbols and you know that's not telling me what are people seeing up there uh, unless these are really credible witnesses and don't tell me you've been hypnotized or you were seen by some two-bit therapist Right. You know, not a, not every therapist is created equal. And what is a therapist? A Jungian mm. analyst is not a therapist. Mm -hmm. So there are, and don't even get me started on hypnosis. I mean, <laughs> I don't give it any credibility whatsoever. None. And neither did Jung. So one more thing I'd like to mention, sure. because you know it's another pet peeve of mine, is mm. the 2017 it wasn't just the New York Times article. There was also something that came out in Politico and in the Washington Post, I think on the same day, all mm -hmm. about this Navy footage that mm -hmm. came out with the Tic Tac that made the Tic Tac popular. And, right. and their star witness was David Fravor, a Navy pilot, and mm -hmm. with a lot of credentials and a lot of credibility. But 
What is not talked about, and when I had Ralph Blumenthal, who was one of the authors of that New York Times piece, when I had him on my podcast last year, because he wrote a biography on Dr. John Mack, it's called The Believer. We did an episode about it together. It is part of Speaking of Jung because it was part of my quarantine series. You and I did an episode of the quarantine series together. All of those are available at speakingofjung.com. But what I want to say is this David Fravor pilot and his his colleague i don't i don't know what to refer to her alex dietrich Mm -hmm. who is also a navy pilot Mm -hmm. they were both featured on a pbs miniseries titled carrier which Mm -hmm. came out in 2008 i remember when it came out because i've had a lifelong interest in aircraft carriers it was a 10-part series that aired on pbs television then it was made available on dvd And right now, I think you can get it on Amazon Prime Video. And it's fascinating. It's life aboard an aircraft carrier. It's not scripted. And it it shows you everyone from the people who cook the food to Mm -hmm. the shooters on the deck to the Navy and um, even Marine pilots. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... David Fravor was featured very heavily on the series, and so was Alec Dietrich. And is it Alex? Or it's not Alec, it's Alex, right? I want to make sure I have her name correct. So why wouldn't anybody want to see them in their natural element? It's Alex Dietrich. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't anybody be curious about seeing them in in their their native habitat doing their job aboard the Nimitz? Mm -hmm. And the Nimitz was made famous because of this Tic Tac UFO video that was released. Right. These people were used to being on camera. They were featured quite heavily in, if not all of the 10 episodes. Right. Okay. Why is nobody who mentions Fravor, I watched Fravor's interview on Joe Rogan, I watched the whole thing, never mentioned that he was featured on a PBS miniseries, and right. it was shot, what, wasn't it around the time? When was that footage that... Uh, we are told that, the well, the Tic Tac uh, yeah. inc- allegedly happened in 2004, so it would have been even, you know, four years, it would have been prior to the they they filmed this way before it was released okay so it was around that time isn't that interesting isn't that interesting isn't that interesting that nobody mentions that those two individuals who are the spokespeople for the tic tac right were were featured on this reality series Mm -hmm. and you can watch them fly and alex dietrich talked about flying at night and how um difficult that is and at the end of the series Fravor talks about retiring and how bittersweet that is and he just he seems like a very experienced oh um, yeah yeah pilot and and a a good guy but sure why was he chosen he was it seems chosen as the spokesperson for this thing sure and and the true believers in the You know, the Tic Tac being something from another world uh, will just tell you that none of that matters, you know, about the the Carrier series and that, no, 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 it's you're just reading too much into it. And and that's what we're up against are the true believers. Um, Reading too much into it. Yeah, that that's what they would say. They would say that you're reading too much into and well, you're uh, being I, narrow-minded is what I my I comeback. With you, I find that personally to be very interesting. That you know, um, they would then emerge later as to tell a ah, private detective that they're reading too much into the evidence yeah. they uncover. Exactly, exactly, and uh, but that's what we're up against in the ufology community is that there are people who are open-minded um that will consider these things but you have um what you would call just the right amount which would be a critical mass right just it's not the majority of people but it's just the right amount of people um who are just true believers in these things and they are the most vocal they're the loudest the, yeah. it's from the true believer demographic that emerges the rabid fan boy type 
people you hear us talk about, the people that um, are are on all over UFO Twitter, for example, constantly, you know, slamming, um, uh, you know, the people out there trying to do honest to goodness research, you know, slamming John Greenwald or or, or slamming uh, Mick West, and and the, you know, it's and that's the thing. It's the, the true believerism, okay. and that these narratives. Um, are serving and again it comes back to you know um, it being easier to external easier to look at them and criticize them than it is to look at yourself and do the work right. on yourself so right, right. okay walter so thank well, you well is there anything you want to uh, <laughs> uh say again about where to find uh, you know r remind everybody where to find your podcast and you know Oh, so it's at Speaking of Jung, J U N G dot com. It's also on YouTube um, under my name, which is Jungian Laura, J U N G I A N L A U R A. That's also my Twitter name. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but really just go to Speaking of Jung dot com because it's not about me, it's about the brilliant work of these analysts. I have extensive show notes on every episode. So again, don't ignore the psychology. That's what I'd like to leave you with. Well, that's great. Thank you again so much for doing this. You're, you're actually my first uh, uh, actual guest. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Uh, I appreciate that. No, no. Hey, I appreciate Again, I appreciate you taking the time. To, anytime. Uh, anytime. We, we, we've had great conversations together, yeah. and I, I like to share where we go in those conversations yeah. with the audience. So again, thank you. And um, uh, I will be uh, at, um, again, I'll be at San Diego Comic-Con this weekend and um, doing my live stream and stuff from down there. So oh, great. I look uh, yeah. forward to it. That'll, that'll be uh, that'll be fun. So okay, well, thanks again, Laura, and thanks to the audience, everybody uh, who uh, listening to this, and I will uh, see you next time.